Welcome back to American Zarathustra. This is episode 41 of Imperium Art. Today, we are very happy to welcome a member of the White Art Collective, a highly talented singer-songwriter. Among the musicians in the White Art Collective, our guest stands out with a musical style that is both familiar and totally unique. His vocal stylings are complex, yet melodic, his lyrics inspired and revealing a personalized worldview. His music, a sort of soundscape for his inner world. His music is earnest, absorbing, and multi-layered. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome with me, Alma Lahar. How are you doing, sir? I'm great. How are you? Very good, very good. Thanks so much for joining us. And let me uh, quickly also introduce my friend and co-host, Nullis, host of the poetry cast on white art collective d live conversations with the wind how are you today buddy hello donald and hello al malahar and hello to the audience so as we jump into this real quick um can you give us the meaning or background for your name al malahar yeah so <laughs> um it took me forever to come up with a stupid name. And Alma is typically a woman's name from like the old days. But uh, I guess it, the word actually comes from Latin or an offshoot of it. That yeah. essentially means like nourishing or beneficial. Okay. And then Lahar is a, a basically a mud flow after a volcano erupts and just destroys everything in its path. Wow. So that right there describes you and your music <laughs> in its own way, right? <laughs> Um, I guess so, yeah. Yeah, I've been uh, absorbing your music a lot today to kind of get in the mood for, for talking with you and getting more, obviously, familiar with the huge variety of music that you have. It's not just the recent stuff you've put out, but you've gone through a number of musical iterations, and um, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty blown away. Of course, I'm a musician as well, so I understand all the nuances and, and the various aspects of that. Um, so we'd like to talk about your whole musical history. Uh, maybe you could kind of start off, you know, with your influences, what instruments you play, um, why you write music, why this is something you do. And I'll just hand the mic off to you. All right. Uh, you'll have to get me on track because I'm going to get sidetracked here. But um, uh, Don't it, worry, I'm pretty good at that. Yeah. Okay. Influences. Well, um, I picked up violin when I was in fourth grade because I wanted to make my mother happy. Like, oh, I specifically remember that. It's like, oh, hey, isn't that adorable? That's a, great, um, that's a great motive right there, actually. She kind of encouraged it. But um, we did like it was kind of cool because we did these like um, music um, assessment tests in like mm -hmm. fourth grade where people came in and you had to like listen to headphones and then they would test you on your hearing to be able to like decipher different notes, octaves, and all that stuff. Huh. And and I got the highest score in the class. I even beat the smartest kid in the class. Like it was a oh, huge God. it was a huge achievement for a fourth grader. Um, but yeah, so I started playing viol violin in fourth grade. Played that all the way through high school. Um, I picked up guitar lessons when I was about thirteen, and I took. That's the time. Yeah, it is. It seems to be a pretty common. Uh, age for a lot of musicians. Now, but, did you um, want to be a rock star, or you were more just interested in the instrument itself? Um, mostly just in interested in the instrument, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like, as already had play been playing a stringed instrument, guitars okay. kind of seemed like the next uh, logical mm -hmm. step. Okay. Um, so I picked that up and I started taking guitar lessons. I did two, two and a half years of classical finger style. Um, wow. And Okay, and then, so you started off classical. That's quite different from most people who start off with folk or rock. And uh, what's the difference between classical music or classical guitar and the standard rock guitar? The difference, I, I guess, is just using my fingers. Like I don't, I don't use a pick even to this day because that's how I've been trained. I, a pick always felt a pick felt like an anchor. It felt so weird. So mm. like it kind, it kind of limits me because I, I don't know. I can't really do all that shredding and cool stuff that all the metal players do, but that's not really my style anyway. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, since I was already in orchestra, it kind of made sense. It's like, well, I play classical music every day at school, so I might as well just 
do it with guitar too. So you had a pretty strong background in music theory and understanding how to read and uh, rather how to understanding music in general, just reading it, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. So, and then how did you go from that to who you are now? Um, hmm. A lot of people what? start off with rock stars. They want to emulate somebody. I wanted to be, you know, like my favorite rock star as a kid. And you kind of grow out of that over time. But those influences, they stay with you. They kind of naturally come out of your, your songwriting. But you started off in classical. <laughs> you know, that's a quite a different yeah. approach, right? Yeah. So I, I you know, I, I don't know. I, um, what made me take a different approach, I guess, was the music I started listening to in, in junior high. So mm -hmm. like the first band I really got into was Alice in Chains. Okay. Right. So my friend like let, lent me their, uh, I don't know, it was one of their, one of their like uh, greatest hits albums or something. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was awesome, dude. I was blown away. And like anytime I get into an artist that resonates with me. Yeah, it's like all I listen to and I, I listen the, the hell out of it to the point right. where it kind of becomes dull. But I mean, <laughs> I guess one of the reasons I pursued music was because I wanted to make people feel with my music the way those other people made me feel from their music. You know what I mean? Like that yeah. influence oh, and inspiration yeah. that I got from other artists is like it, you can't put a price on that. You know, how, how did uh, how did Alice in Chains make you feel? I don't know. I, when I started listening to them, I was in junior high, so you have all that, you know, young teenage angst and stuff. Yeah. So I, maybe their music kind of resonated with that. But mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'm from the Pacific Northwest, right? So it that sound, you know, kind of also it it goes with the weather. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can understand how that works. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, exactly. So, so you you must have moved on to other musical influences. What other um, now here's an interesting question. So as musicians, there's there's bands, etc., that we love and we, we wish we were like them. But then there's bands that we sound like, whether we like it or not. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Somehow it just sort of, you know, oh, you sound like X, you know, whatever. So what are some of the bands that you you love and kind of wish you sounded like? I guess the top three would be Tool, Richelieu and the the Mars Volta, but the old Mars Volta, because all their new they just got progressively worse. Um, but I guess out of those three, this band called Richelieu, um, and I'll, I sound autistic because I shill for them so much. But I, mm -hmm. my friends and I would go to their shows. They're uh, they're not too well known, but if you like Tool, if you like prog rock, like yeah, I was just gonna say there's a there's a prog rock sort of edge here, but go on. Yeah. Um, my friends, we were probably their most annoying fans. Oh my god! But uh, <laughs> okay. they they were they had such a massive impact on us because their music was it really hit us, um, mm -hmm. and then we got to experience them by going to their shows, and we even got to play a show with them, no which was way. dude, it was so cool. It was oh, a, they sweet too. they were they hit us up on MySpace, and they were having trouble getting. They saw that we were, had this show um, in our area, and they're like, yeah. "Hey." Uh, can you guys get us on the ticket? We've been trying to get a hold of them and they won't respond. So I was like, sure. And, what's, uh, what's MySpace? I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, holy cow, I haven't heard that in a long time. I miss no, but Tom. That's, that's I miss awesome. Tom. Um, but, uh, so like progressive rock, uh, like I, I, I had a massive progressive rock uh, phase when I was younger. But for me, it was like King Crimson, um, Emerson, Lake and Palmer, early Genesis, you know, that, I guess that kind of stuff. How How is that different from the prog rock that you like? Um, I I don't know. So like uh, Byrovius, you guys might know him. Sure, he, sure. he actually showed me some King Crimson the other day and I listened to a few songs and it's, you can tell that it was from a different era, even though the music is still prog, right? Like it's structure. The, okay. sa the sound, I guess, like how it harmonizes with you is you can tell it's from a different era. So it doesn't I don't know. It, it's hard to describe. It probably has more of an impact on the people who were alive then mm -hmm. than it does me listening to it now. You know what I mean? 
I think for sure a lot of that early stuff was very strongly informed by classical music. Maybe not so much King Crimson. They're they're more uh, soundscape, uh, soundtracky in in a certain way. There's there's a lot of math involved in in the music, uh, and there's so many iterations of that band. They're not like one band. It's another tangent, but um, but you look at Tool and especially their videos and stuff. There's there's just something about it where it's kind of just kind of musing and droning on an idea. And it doesn't follow the format of, you know, verse, verse, chorus, verse, verse, chorus, and close. You know, like it's not pop music, you know. It's uh, it's sort of music that's aspiring to be more art. Would you agree? A hundred percent. And that's why I, I like those types of bands so much. Because, you know, the verse, verse, chorus, bridge thing gets worn out mm-hmm. a lot. It, and when I listen to like Tool or any of those other prog rock bands, you know, it's like, oh, this song's 10 minutes long. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> and it's not like a verse chorus, verse chorus, you know, it just, it's, it's a journey. It's a 10 minute journey and get ready. Yeah. Cause it's going to take you somewhere. I always feel it's in a sense, like a sonic movie, you know, like a short film for your ears and your imagination and some, yeah. like because it doesn't, it, it t- it's total disregard for any kind of pop sensibility whatsoever. It's like reading a short novel or some kind of thing like that. And you, you go on this journey and you, you have, you know, opens up worlds of imagination in your mind. Now, how would you say your music does that? Does your music have that aspect or quality? Not even close. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help you out here, bud. I know, I know. Yeah. Uh, well, not yet. Describe... Hopefully oh, one day. Hopefully oh, okay. one day. The problem well, is with a lot of my music that you guys have heard is it's it's mostly been collab work where I didn't write the music, other people did, and I just did the vocals and the lyrics. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. I, I haven't. Uh, I'm actually like rediscovering music after kind of taking like an eight year hiatus. And holy moly! That's yeah. Cool. I got I got sucked. I fell off my surfboard in the Caliuga and I got sucked under in the rip current. It took me like eight, eight years to find the surface again <laughs> and get back on my board. What a great. And that's the concept for your next album right there. You know, surfing the Caliuga right there, dude. Um, so quickly, um, uh, I don't know if what Nellis wanted to pop in a little bit and had any questions or comments. Well, just just a quick one with the uh, the whole question came up of rock operas like we, mm-hmm. we don't. We don't even hear any of that anymore. And I think that, you know, in the 70s and the early 80s, well, actually, the late 60s, 70s and early 80s, you had these aspirations for more, Mm. for something, you know, elevating rock to a new level, if you will. Mm. And then something happened, you know, and I think the 80s in my, I mean, it's maybe because, you know, that would be the strongest uh, cultural influence uh, or or, uh, uh, for me. Um, I think that the the 80s was very experimental as well. You also had uh, long tracks. Uh, you know, you had these, uh, uh, you know, you had the short pop version and then you had the long version on the LP or what have you. Um, but nowadays, like, none of that is, exists anymore. It seems like everything now is just factory made and just pumped out and, and there's just no aspiration. So do you, and maybe this is a question to both of you, do you think there's even space for something like a, a rock opera in, in our day and age? Alma? I think there's a necessity for it at this point. <laughs> Any, anything's better than what we got right now. <laughs> wow. wow. So this is actually a good point right here because we, we often ask people, oh, what music do you like? It almost defines you better to say, what music do you not like? You know, could you could you speak to that? Well... If it's on the radio, I chances are I don't like it. Let, let's, let's put it this way. I would rather listen to the Mexican station on the radio than anything else that's in English. But I actually settle on listening to the classical station because it's the least cucked. Occasionally, they will try to insert some, like, uh, anti-white stuff, you know, uh, with, you know, equality or whatever. But it's, yeah. Well, what's so. that song? Wall of Voodoo's Mexican radio song? <laughs> Great, too. <laughs> that that song makes me think of uh, Mamas and the Pepe's because yeah. it's got a certain humor to it and the whole thing. Yeah. Um, so let's go. Let's back up a little bit then. Um, you let's say I don't, I don't know how old you are or what, but let's say 
you know, what are some of the bands or some of the projects you've been in over the years that, you know, formed your, your whole style and, and got you to where you are now? Okay, so vocally, I, most of my influence is actually from female artists because I'm a tenor, which is a fancy way of saying you have a girly man voice. <laughs> but, uh, like, I grew up with this, – this might reveal my age. I grew up with, like, Alanis Morissette, Sarah McLaughlin, like, all, like, the big female artists of the 90s, right? It was, like, a, a thing at the time, too, all these – the new female rock thing, you know? Yeah, and, and they were they – were, I don't know. They were good. I mean, I, when I listen to it, now it, it takes me back. But like Alanis Morissette, for example, like Jagged Little Pill, I don't, it might sound weird coming from me, but that's a really good album. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I, I have a lot of, a lot of my vocal influences from her. Bjork is another one, early Bjork. Um, wow. because she, dude, she has so much power in this tiny oh, little yeah. package. It's insane. The notes she can hit and the power behind them. It's, it's nuts. Um, I don't know so if it's it, fair to say this, but I don't think of her so much as a female artist as an artist because she really goes off the, the radar as far as all the different musical aspects and the compositions. But go ahead. I'm sorry to cut you off. Oh, it's all good. Uh, yeah, she's I haven't really got into her like uh, newer stuff, I guess. I guess her first few albums is what I listened to for a while. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, so vocally, I most of my influence is probably from female artists. Mm-hmm. But then like music as far as like guitar goes or writing music uh a lot of joe satriani joe satri because he that wow. dude can take you on journeys and he doesn't even need to say a single word so tell for the audience's sake who is joe satriani what's his style of music he is a an instrumentalist and mm-hmm. all he does is play guitar and he's one of the best guitar players in the world so would you say he's jazz or fusion or what would you what style of music? It's too hard to describe. <laughs> <laughs> it really I mean it's he creates stories and journeys with his guitar. Like that it it takes your mind into uh, it, it take it, you Nolas had written something about it. Oh right here, the overall value of a work of art is measured by its ability to take the audience out of space and time. That's what he does with a guitar. You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. just beautiful, beautiful music. Um, on, the, uh, on the female vocalist thing, I, I'm i not really influenced by female vocalists, but I'm extremely influenced by one female vocalist, Joni Mitchell. So I super strongly advise you to get into Joni Mitchell. Start off with her album called Blue. And anyone in the audience, I strongly recommend that as well. It's It's just exquisite stuff, but I'll let you move on. I have not heard of her. Jo- Joni Mitchell, you said. Joni Mitchell. <laughs> Mitchell. I'll, uh, I'll have to send you a link. She, she's one of the epic classic. She, uh, she wrote the song Woodstock. She was, uh, she's from the, like the 60s and 70s. Really, the 70s is, is her period. Um, it, it's, it's, it's kind of upsetting me that you don't know who she is. <laughs> but <laughs> it'll be a beautiful thing when you finally look her up. You know, it'll it'll uh, blow your mind for sure. But uh, so then you're you're moving along and you now you said you stopped doing music for eight years. That's intense, dude. What uh, got you back into it? Well, it was actually, I, you know, I, I tr- it's strange, dude. I uh, when I had made mention of falling off my surfboard there, it's I I lost touch of what really mattered, I guess. Mm. And and I lost touch of who I really am inside. Mm-hmm. And uh and with music, you might be able to relate. You can't really force inspiration. If it's not there and you try to force it, it's it almost sets you back more. At least that's been my experience. Yeah. So over those eight years, I tried to get back into it. I tried doing some open mics. Uh, I actually was in this one band. We played like a house party. And they were kind of like a... Dude, they they were weird. It was so weird. It was like a almost like a they had full brass, right? And then me on electric. It was almost like a uh, a ska metal band. It was totally out of my element, but I figured I'd give it a shot. But um, what got me back into music was uh, a friend that I met who is the guy I did most of my songs with that you guys have heard, who goes by the name of B. And uh, I was introduced 
to him through mutual friends and he's like oh i heard you do music i was like yeah why do you want to know he's like because i do music too i was like all right well let's do something and uh working i worked with him for like 18 months i think and then he he's basically i i appeared as the villain in the anti-white narrative right and he's like we're not we can't we can't work together anymore you know you hate this this and this and you know what i mean so okay. i kind i kind of he believes what he believes and he doesn't see the world the way we do, but I didn't present to him something, you know, I didn't show him what we see here in this community. You know what I mean? So, but writing music with him got me back into that process and discovering like myself and my potential for that. And then I think the first song we did was mud world and somebody, I posted it on Gab, and somebody was like, oh, dude, have you heard of the White Art Collective? They'd oh, love to hear this. And that's how I got connected with WAC. So it was because of me working with this guy, B, you know, hmm. who most so, likely is anti-white. But it's like, dude, you never know who you're going to run into who's going to bring you to where you're at today. So it's, it's kind of cool how it worked out. That's incredible, dude. Tell us about Mud World. What, what are the lyrics and what's the theme of the song? So the theme of the song, and, and <laughs> I don't know where this came from. So we call it Mud World. I call it Mud World. My, my friends and I call the homeless people here in town mud people. Mm. And that some people might not laugh at that. But uh, when the homeless crisis got really bad in this town, I don't know how many years ago, um, mm. it just exploded, right? So like they were literally busing these people in from all over the country because Jeez. my state – incentivizes it right west West coast worst coast and uh left coast yeah yeah exactly and so the they were all living down on the river like the whole river was just tents and tarps right and so we started calling them river people but it was like no that's too endearing and it turns out the river is muddy most of the year so we started calling them mud people so mud world is like a reference to all right home homelessness um but the lyrics kind of it's a short song but the lyrics basically talk about a guy who gets into drugs becomes homeless but then turns his life around at the end right oh so and that's represented in the in the final the the lyrics in the outro there so So there's it's maybe important to stop for a second and distinguish the difference between people that become homeless through no choice of their own and then the massive amount of slackers who choose to become homeless because they think they're sticking it to the man and the system and are in, in some weird political way kind of, uh, I don't know, uh, dropping out, I guess. Would you say that's that's generally true? Yeah. I mean, in, in, in my area, too, I would try to keep an open mind, you know, about a lot of these people. But I... I'm not exaggerating when I say nine out of ten were usually drug addicts who just figured out it's easier to afford your heroin habit when you don't have to pay rent. So, and it, you know, these weren't people who got unlucky, lost a job, or the economy was bad and they couldn't afford their mortgage anyway. I didn't see a lot of that. I think I saw one family in a van, you know, and the rest was just junkies, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Damn. That's a, a huge epidemic problem. That's it's awful. The idea that the government, local government, would incentivize that is beyond sickening. You know that that's literally the opposite of what they should be doing. So it's it's harsh. Uh, Nolis, did you want to comment at all? Oh, not nothing yet. I mean, this is just perfect. It's uh, mm, okay. you know, it's a great journey understanding uh, all Malahar's process and and um, how he got to where he's at. So. Mm-hmm. So um, that was the beginning then. That, now, um, what was it about that song that your friend thought would you know, connect you to the White Art Collective? What's the, what's the connection there? Oh, you mean the guy on Gab who referenced Wax? Correct. Um, he, he really liked the, the outro at the end. Okay. He was like, dude, that's, this is you? I was like, yeah. He's like, oh, it sounds good. People at Wack would kind of want to hear this maybe. Mm-hmm. So, so this is kind of a turning point for you. You discovered the White Art Collective, um, and how, you know, I understand how you discovered. Then I would then ask, like, what was that journey like for you going into the White Art Collective and seeing all the different musicians and creators, content creators, etc., within it? Describe that process or that journey. 
I'm trying to describe it without crying because it's been a pretty <laughs> it's been a pretty powerful experience lately. Wow. But uh, Get your so out. yeah, oh yeah, I'm gonna I've been yeah I'm knee deep in tissues here. Um, <laughs> So when I first heard of whack, right, he directs me to him. I think I got a hold of Jeff, but he didn't quite get back to me. But I started watching the live stream on YouTube, right? And it's like 11 viewers, 8 viewers. I'm like, what is this, right? <laughs> I, I scoffed at it, right? Um, and at that time, there was only a few artists. Like, I think it was like Friendship. I think Hyrus was there. Um, yeah. Uberfolk. Yeah. Folk dissident, Wolf Shantz, like they, there wasn't a, a whole lot as compared to now currently. Yeah. Um, but I thought it was really cool. I was like, well, this is awesome that somebody's doing this. Um, but really, I so I think I've been a part of the White Art Collective for what, maybe two years now? I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, but I literally kind of just dipped my toes for two years, dude. Mm -hmm. And I, I really only feel, right, I really feel that only in the last few months have I finally taken the dive and like jumped in full force. You know what I mean? Oh. Um, because I realized that this community is like what I've been looking for my whole life as a white artist, yeah. or as a white artist. Mm -hmm. And, uh, this is, ab this is absolutely necessary for me to like break free of this anti-white prison. Sure. That is this world. You know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm totally finding, rediscovering like that spirit of the West people keep talking about in this community. Right. Beautiful. So yeah. White art collective is, it's definitely, it's vital a hundred percent. I strongly agree. What does it mean to be a white artist? In, in, according to what you were just saying? Well, artists usually try to interpret what they see or feel about the world or reality. Um, and obviously is a white person who has opinions on our current situation and position on this uh, planet, mm. we need our own sphere because if you try to bring any of this anywhere else, you're going to get lynched. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, you're going to get lynched. Try playing a show in Seattle, you know, and talking about this stuff that we're talking about here. You will get burned alive. Damn, dude. That's harsh. That's evil. That's very, very evil. Um, so it, maybe you could go a bit deeper, though. I, I understand what you're saying, and I think it's actually a, a very good microcosmic explanation of the bigger picture of the White Art Collective, why we do what we do, who we are, etc. cetera. But um, let's go into, like, kind of look under the hood there. What about your music is white positive or white conscious? What, you know, because I'm trying to define for the audience or give an example to the audience what a white artist is per se so i guess most of my stuff most of my music is kind of just a projection right it's me projecting is all it really is right so like a lot of my lyrics have to do with self-improvement because i've sure. always i've always struggled with that and so you'll see that theme a lot in a lot of my songs where the song will either be openly talking about like self-improvement or will start off as like mud world is the perfect example right it, singing about a dude who's doing drugs and then gets becomes homeless but then at the end of the song there's a there's a solution and right we have we have a transformation because solutions were implemented so i think that's like that's a lot of the, the theme of what i try to get at because it's something i've been trying to get at personally for a long time and specifically speaking to a white audience about the issues that we face, uh, like, you know, the opioid epidemic, for example, or our government, uh, you know, paying for our destruction in these kinds of ways, like incentivizing homelessness, etc. Um, I think this is a question for both Nullis and you. It's it's kind of the, the big question for us artists and creators is what what's the um, the guidelines for how to write lyrics or poetry in, in, in Nolis's case that convey, you know, this is white art and yet at the same time have some kind of artistic standards that make it an elevated art. Could you speak to that a bit, Oma? Um, why don't you let Nellis go first on this one? <laughs> let, <laughs> let the big brain go first. <laughs> oh, boy. 
Um, yeah, that's a tough one, to be honest with you. I mean, it's it's a tough one, but it's not a tough one. Well, we do. Um, yeah. so, so the way I look at it is anything that is European in its inception, um, American in its inception, um, these are all, by default, these are all white uh, expressions of white art. That's what it is. Um, whether or not it's, um, you know, uh, a poem, a song, a work of art, um, an architectural masterpiece, you know, these are all expressions of our civilization. Now, to make it explicitly so would be to then incorporate various elements that highlight these attributes. I would say that 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 you don't necessarily have to do that all the time. I think that there's a lot of uh, ways to convey a message where somebody listens to it and then they can identify with it and they understand almost implicitly that this is this belongs to me. This is a part of my tradition. Um, and this is where I think, and of course, you know, people will argue about this all the time, but this is where I do think nationalism is important. And we need to define what nationalism is very clearly. And we have to say, for example, being American is being white. That's what it has to mean. Um, it, it doesn't mean it, being American isn't just an idea. It's, it's much more than just an idea. It's, it's a, a location. It's a history. It's a heritage. It has roots in Europe. And so that's what we have to really focus on. By doing that, we then can create this understanding among the people that it's okay to be a nationalist. It's okay to love your nation. And it's okay to say that your nation is white. So I, I'm, I, I don't know if I'm running off on a tangent with this, but by, by writing in a way where you can express these thoughts, I think, I think you, get, you get a very clearer picture without necessarily having to uh, go into the, you know, the, the everyday uh, political aspect of it. So you can, you can talk about the emotional aspect, you can talk about the cultural aspect, the uh, metaphysical aspect of it. So all of these different elements that are inherently ours um, have, can be expressed in a way that people understand that this is for us and not for anyone else. I hope that made sense. Beautifully stated, very beautifully stated. Um, Alma, do you do you want to respond to that or share any of your own thoughts? No, oh, there's no way I could follow that, dude. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> well, let me let me help you a little bit. It seems to me like your music is responding to issues that people who are awoken or have a racial awakening to the the crisis that whites face specifically in America, but certainly in the Western world, you know, when you write songs responding to that and you're white, then you're writing white music per se. I mean, for lack of a better descriptive term and your music does that, although it does it in a, a sophisticated way. And I, I'm kind of trying to give you a springboard here. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, this is actually a really tough question. Um, I I don't know. I, ever since I got into whack, right? There's been a, a slow awakening happening okay. within my within myself, right? And so this, and it's a racial awakening, right? And so sure. the 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 more that that spirit, my European spirit, is awakened, the the more my subject matter and what I want to convey through my songs is going to take shape a european shape right and mm. like what do europeans do we explore we pioneer we create we invent we literally drive evolution mm -hmm. of the human species right so mm -hmm. it's like mu the mu music can reflect that and so mm. i th again kind of going back to like most of my subjects have to do with self-improvement right which is just essentially evolution mm. um I, I think that's something that Europeans do better than a lot of people, right? We mm -hmm. we're the ones that drive evolution. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. I I often say, you know, we're the ones that put a robot on Mars. You know, <laughs> like what other, you know? Yeah. That, that's an insane, insane achievement. 
and it's a culmination of, of Western civilization. It says so much. It's interesting to me that the theme of self-improvement keeps coming up with you. Um, what, what are the forces against that? Like what are things that you're facing personally and what are say the forces that are facing whites in general uh, regarding how our self-improvement? So me personally, oh, we're going to get personal here. Um, <laughs> well, I don't know. The last, the last few months, dude, like I said, I, I keep referring to, it's been, a, it's been a tumultuous time between like what's happening in the world, where I've been at, right? Like so this last winter was like one of the blackest of black pills I've ever had. And I don't, I don't usually typically do well in the winter. I appreciate the winters for what they do when they're over. But going through winter when it's dark at four o'clock and it just is pissing rain every single day, you it's don't rough. see the sun. You know what I mean? It's uh, it kind of gets to you. So you throw that in with everything that happened last year at the end of the year through winter. It was like, yeah, it was a rough one for me. So I and then I started working this horrific job where I was working basically like 60 to 70 hours a week for the last few months. And then I had kind of had a birthday somewhere in there. So it was like all this stuff came together and it made me realize how how, impo how important like this community is, right? Because, mm -hmm. and I don't even know if, if I'm, I don't even know how I got off on this tangent just now. I'm just kind of speaking from it's the science. heart. Go for it, man. Go for it. But it's got to the point for me where everything in the world is so rotten that there's nothing left to turn to except us and myself, right? Like, and I've, I've been told my whole life from different institutions and different communities that the solution is never me, right? I'm the problem. That's okay. what I've always been told and I'm sick of it. And I yeah. finally, and I feel, finally realized through this community and through no, uh, you know, Jason at no white guilt. It's like, yeah. no dude, I am the, the solution is within me. It's just buried under all this rot and I got to dig for it. And it, yeah. it's there. It just, it's going to take a while to, to dig it up. Sure. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's been a, that, that's a pretty a, life changing process that's recently. A super, super powerful <laughs> message that you're conveying here. And it's something that we have to constantly remind ourselves that in order for the movement to succeed, we have to succeed as individuals and that we, we are, we demonstrate to the people around us specifically, obviously white people around us, both in IRL in real life and online, that we're growing and we're succeeding and we're we're you know becoming stronger and we're in in some way getting around or not affected by the this anti-white narrative. That this is pretty much the whole concept of the racial awakening of uh, no white guilt, uh, go free, all of these things that are the the dialectic in our sphere, and it's it's tough in, in many, many, many ways, because of course, like you just said, the, the things going on in the world, but then just the, you know, looking at yourself and feeling kind of alone. So the community is key. What our collective is central to this. And, you know, and obviously the other people, there's many, many people around our sphere that are all contributing in their own way. And yeah, we're still growing. We don't all agree. We don't have to agree on everything. We, everybody's got their, their sort of, uh, you know, the content that they provide, but it's ex it's very exciting and very enriching world that we're living in. So, but yet at the same time, you might not have that around you physically, right? And that can be tough, man. And and, and like like you're saying, a, you know, depressing winter season and getting through these things. So I feel like probably music must have had some, I don't know, th I don't want to use therapeutic, but a, a helpful. Uh, role in your life to get through that. Do, do you find that music transmutes this suffering into something uh, beneficial for you? Yeah, and I'm glad you actually touched on that. So kind of back to my eight-year music hiatus, right? And then the last two years of working with my friend and doing other collabs with people from WAC. Mm. I, ha I haven't written my own song in like 12 years, right? Mm. So as I'm coming out of this tumult of the winter, I uh, picked up my guitar for once <laughs> and I started writing a song, dude. And it was a song that like, I have a bunch of like loop effects saved on my pedal and cool. I just started playing along to one of them. Right. And something mm -hmm. happened. I was like, Oh, that sounds really good. And so I recorded it 
that's another thing about WAC. Like I don't know anything about digital audio workstation software, but I've learned by asking people in WAC, like, oh, how do you do this? Oh, okay. It's how you learn by asking, right? Sure. sure. Um, so I start. So nice I, to talk to, but go on. Yeah. You know, it, it, the, everyone's, they want to help. And that's the cool thing yeah. too. Yeah, um, yeah. So I'm starting to write this song and it just kind of happened automatically. It wasn't like, oh yeah, I'm going to sit down. I'm going to write a song. No, it was just like, like I said, everything else is so rotten, dude. There's, there's nothing to turn to except creativity. Like mm -hmm. I have to, I have to create. So yeah. I start writing this song and it, and I don't expect anybody once it's done, I don't expect anybody to, I don't expect anybody to be hit by it at the level that it hits me because like this mm -hmm is is some it's a massive breakthrough for me dude so it's like right. <laughs> i talk about crying all the time dude i've cried more in the last four months than i have my entire life <laughs> 90 90 percent of those tears have been tears of joy because i'm rediscovering like beauty who i who i am and who i like who i have to be right so yeah, yeah i i'm almost done with this song i've been preparing for some uh, other things that you know you might know about right um yeah, oh yeah so that's kind of <laughs> that's kind of taking the <laughs> That's kind of taken my uh, the, the shift of the focus, right? Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, this I'm I'm close to finishing this song, and I'm I'm super excited. But it it has it's helped me more than I ever could have imagined. You That's know what I mean? So inspiring! It's so inspiring because you, in a sense, it it, it looks really like you are the the example of us. In in a sense, you crystallize us in the sense that you you came from a kind of a confused dark place you discovered the white art collective you reignited your creativity you're breaking through the darkness and the loneliness and all those weird negative hardships that we're living in today and now you're coming out like a phoenix on the other side with this brilliant music and it's it's uh it's exemplary and so the like just you talking about tears of joy shows you know, the, the the profundity of what it is that you're experiencing and it's a great lesson for everyone listening so yeah. um Nulls, did you want to respond yeah i just wanted to add a few thoughts to this um, really exceptional uh, uh conversation so far um first of all we're talking about well-being and when we talk about well-being, we must talk about confidence, self-confidence. And part of the healing process has to be uh, understanding who we are, where we come from, what's our stock, who are we, who were our ancestors, how did we get to where we're at, and, and being unapologetic about all of these things. It's an extremely important process in healing because if you have self-doubt if you push yourself down unnecessarily if you allow this this anti-white narrative if you allow these detractors uh cynics to constantly form your uh opinions or influence your your emotions then then you know that's the prison that they want to keep us in and that's something that we have to break free and and or go free as as jason would put it but beyond that, you also have, because we're talking on an individual level here, what we have to do is work in communities, whether you're an artist, whether you're working on an everyday kind of uh, community level with your friends where you live, wherever you are, whatever you do, the, the community is extremely important. The collective is Im extremely important. So, so when you work with other people, you grow you find confidence in the community, through the community, with the community. All of these things matter. So it's it's really it's really uh, heartening to hear, you know, how how Alma Lahar is going through this process and sharing it so openly. And I hope that this this will be a a, 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 a perfect example for everyone listening to the show to see. And especially now, we have a lot of people out there that are extremely. Uh, isolated because their friends don't understand or their family doesn't understand mm -hmm. or maybe they just live in an area where it's just they're just surrounded by this uh, negative uh, influence so we have communities out there and I think that people have to uh, move beyond the virtual at some point but also take advantage of the virtual so that they can then start this process 
and learn and grow. So that was just my two cents. I think that was a little more than two cents, but okay. <laughs> yeah. Dude, that was worth at least 49 cents. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that was well beautifully said. Seriously. That's it's well, it's great to have you on the show. Recently, I was listening to your appearance on Hyreth's Unplugged show. It's, I believe, in uh, the art culture segment of the White Art Collective. It's on uh, BitChute, and I'm sure it's at whiteartcollective.com somewhere. Could you talk about that performance a little bit? I could talk about how I wish the sound quality was better. <laughs> uh, I did, and I did one as well, and it. I, I know, but I mean, it is, quote, unplugged, but um, uh, there's lots of good stuff on there, though, musically. Um, it's, you know, go on, if you can talk about it a bit. Yes, yeah, so I think well, the first song I played, I think, was Dissension, was a, which was a song that I wrote um, mm. back in uh, 2008, mm. I think, 2008 or 2009. Mm. Uh, and that was one of the songs I played with my band. Um that song is about drug addiction. Um, obviously, I'm not going to go into my personal details, but it, you know, it's a plague, and it's obviously been directed at our people more than anybody, right? Like, Mix. I mean, I can tell you, ninety ninety percent out of of the homeless people are all white. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I rarely see non-white homeless people, and it's it is noticeable. Um, so, that, I think that was the first song I played on that set, and then. What else did I play? I played the two two part guitar instrumental, which was actually the first song I ever wrote, yeah. um, and that I don't know. I, I think I was listening to a lot of Joe Satriani at the time, and I was taking my classical gu- guitar lessons, so that's kind of where the inspiration for that song came up. That song. What's the name of that song, by the way? Because it really stuck out. It doesn't have a. It doesn't have a title. <laughs> you son of a gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're gonna have to. Do you think you'll ever put lyrics to it, or just leave it be? I don't know. It it could use lyrics. I, there's definitely room for it. Mm. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Yeah, I'll have to put the link to that show. Well, of course, I'm going to have links to your music uh, below this show. So every we always do that. Um, any other highlights in that that performance? Yeah, there was. Uh, let's see, "Welcome Home, Kimba Sue," which it was a song I actually wrote on a train. Mm. I had taken a train ride. I've actually done this train ride several times, but it's a long distance train ride. It's a couple of days. And uh, I wrote the guitar for that on the train. And I do have lyrics and stuff for it, but I, I, it's a song I've never completed because mm. I, it, it's, ha- it's hard to complete a song where you're, when your head isn't really in the space that it was when you started the song, right? Yeah, so, I, get that. I don't know. I had revisited it last year and actually had recorded lyrics, but I don't mm. know. We'll see. And it's in a really high key. It's even kind of too high for me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And then there was, what was the other song I played? Oh, To Build a Better Us. And I actually changed the chords around to like, so I I used to be, I used to play on the worship team back when I was in church, back in like junior high and early high school. Yeah. And so like a lot of like Christian worship music is another part of my background because Mm -hmm. I, was on the worship team. I was the worship leader for junior high youth group when I was in high school. Like, so I, I kind of did like a Christian worship iteration on to build a better us. And I actually, I really liked the way it turned out. It completely changed the, the tonality of the song. It was pretty, pretty emotional. Could you talk more about your lyrics though? I want to get into what, what's some of the, the message that you're trying to get across in your music. Um, like I said before, mostly like self improvement stuff, yeah. but I mean it, it it it's it's strange because like when I am presented with a song to put lyrics to it the the lyrics are always defined later on, like the subject of the song. It's not like I'm like, oh, I'm gonna this song's gonna be about this. It's never like that. the okay. song the song will let me know what it's gonna be about, right? Wow, um, that's kind of how I feel, that's, but it, you it's, it's manic, actually. You know, that's like I was I've been having this discussion with people. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I feel that artists are in a shaman class in a sense um, that we we somehow pull out meaning out of the, this this sort of cosmic void within us, so to speak. And 
and any artist could understand that how like inspiration for example and getting into a flow state and these things and like you just saying the song tells me what it's going to be about that that proves my point a bit but um i i don't know if you can quote some of your lyrics or you could talk through that a bit and maybe in a little more detail um let's let's see here um okay yeah so like the maelstrom for example um when my friend first presented this song to me the the sound of the song reminded me of like a ship lost at sea at night like that's like it's it was like some kind of like techno synth sailing song it was okay. that that's like the best way i can describe I it i get it i get it that's the flow or the the mood of the music yeah yeah and uh the thing is about the way he wrote his songs is he always had i wasn't like his style of music wasn't necessarily my style but it really helped me be adaptive to do different things in different styles. It really helped my development, but his outros, dude, I, he's, I called him the outro master cause the outros on his song, I just loved them. Wow. Um, but so like the maelstrom, right? Like I, it's, I'm having like this boating or nautical imagery because of the way the song sounds. Yeah. And like I said, like the song will tell me what it's going to be about, but it's mirrored by what's already going on in my head and my heart. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of, it's kind of, it's strange. It's like, I, I'm not, purposefully gonna write a song that's about a certain subject i choose it's just like the song sounds like this and then i i it's mirrored by what's going on with me at the time i guess mm -hmm. or what that what that song is a, a causing me to emotionally react you know it's getting a reaction out of me that the, the sound right so i get it i i think yeah. that if people were to listen to <clears throat> say cl you know classical music uh Claude Debussy or, or uh, Satie or various, you know, uh, Moonlight Sonata, for example. If you just listen to that song, your mind just comes alive with all these beautiful images and moods, colors and tones. And in a sense, you create a narrative in your mind just naturally because it's such epic, beautiful art, uh, music. And I think in a sense, that's maybe what you're talking about. And also I can identify with that as well. Um, you know this i'm i'm working with uh george george freud as the name he goes by i did the uh the song some day is today and you know it was the music that set the tone right you know that it's got a certain mood or a flow there was this this kind of sad undertone even though it was a fun kind of a 80s synth with pop kind of sound but that there was this strange forlorn sadness in it that i thought Oh man, that's it right there. I can I can capture that mood and then weave out sort of like words out of that somehow, and then melodies that lend themselves to you know to the words and the whole process of writing music is insane. <laughs> I don't know how people do it, but it, it's it is a kind of a magic. And you sense. know, Donald, you yeah. both of you just described essentially. Or just answered your own question uh, from earlier, just now, mm. by by you know you're, you're organically tapping into what mm. belongs to us. Oh, beautifully said. Yep, very, very exactly. Said. See, there you are. Like artists, poets, songwriters w that are woke to white well-being, that are part of our movement. We have a really, really, really critical mission and it, it, whether we like it or not in a sense we have in a sense we channel the the pain and the hope of our people in our movement and that's where i keep saying that in some sense this is shamanistic uh, we're giving voice and form to these things and it, we play an important cultural role not only for our people now and our movement now but for generations to come so it's just it's just such a pleasure to have you on the show to to share your thoughts and experiences with that. I do want to move the the topic a little bit more over to your racial awakening. How did you come into your racial awakening? Paul. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, I, I I I don't. Um, it's it's strange, dude. So like I I I look back at my public school years and I didn't even hear the term white privilege or 
I, I never heard white privilege until like I started going to poll. You know what I mean? Like I, we, we had your typical like black history month with, uh, some dude like straight off the boat from Africa who would come and talk to us about diversity or whatever. But like none of my friends ever felt guilted by any of it. Right. It was just like, can we just go back to class, please? Yeah. Right. Um, it's irritating. Yeah. We we had a lot of the Holocaust propaganda mostly. I can't tell you how many times we read friggin' Night by Elie Wiesel or Diary of Anne Frank. It's just disgusting. Year after year, dude. But we yeah. we we didn't have. I mean, looking back, there's so much of it that was anti-white. But like, I never spe- specifically heard you know, uh, ending your whiteness or white privilege. I never heard those terms until later. But I uh, kind of gone into like con- conspiracy theory type things out of high school. Uh, 9, 9, 11 was a big eye opener. Oh, yeah. And, uh, of course, you know, if you're in our circles, you've probably spent some time on Infowars. Um, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. anyway, one day my friend says to me, Hey dude, have you ever gone to poll? I was like, no, I only go to B and he's like, well, not any anymore. So I started going to poll and I started seeing certain, certain threads, right. On a certain question. Sure. And, um, uh, started going to those threads out of curiosity because you can only go to so many chemtrail or david ike threads <laughs> right. Right, right. and uh i was like okay this is really interesting these people actually have a point so that led me to you know researching s- certain historical events that happened like what 80 years ago that we're not supposed to look into and and it just it, it's all connected right everything's connected yeah. Yeah. and uh and then i, I start I, I i've spent a lot of time working in a major city that's a just an absolute anti-white hellhole. It's it's literally hell on earth. It's disgusting. I hate the place. Um, it was once a beautiful city, like all of our beautiful cities once were. But um, spending time working there for like five years really opened my eyes a lot. And I, I, I it, the anti-whiteism became a lot more apparent, right? And uh, I've also from a state where. I was a minority in a lot of my areas, right? So I've always gravitated toward my own kind automatically, obviously. Sure. But I, I think the real awakening has happened, I mean, like I said, dude, in this, this last few months. I mean, it's been, it's been like a journey. But like I said, I, I've dipped my toes in these white positive communities for the last two years. And now I'm like fully immersed in this thing because mm-hmm. – the awakening really has hit like i i've read go or go free and then i had finished born guilty a few months ago but like the depth of what jason was getting at in his books mm-hmm. it, it it didn't hit me until recently right it was it was the the delayed gratification phrase keeps getting thrown around a lot lately too and that that's kind of what it was so like it's been it's been a process, dude. It's not like one day it was like, oh yeah, I, I got it all figured out now. Right, you know, the right. spirit of the West, all this, you know. It's taken years to like be where I'm at. You know what I mean? And I I still have so much work to do. It's just it's it's kind of it's really daunting. But I mean, that's I'm excited. Like I'm I'm I've never been more white pilled. If if I can put it that with with how dark the world is right now, I've never felt better. See, that's a shining example right there that we are be- like beacons of light in a sense to our people. And your your journey is an excellent example uh, for them as well. Um, it's great that you're reading Jason Kuna's books, Jason Kuna, no white guilt dot com. I would strongly urge everybody to check it out. I, I can never remember if it's dot com or dot org, but either way, that, that'll lead you to his site. So that's uh, central to to what we do. Um, so let's let's talk about um, your reading the Imperium Art essay. Uh, what were some of your thoughts on that essay? Well, first of all, it's a work of art in and of itself. Uh, I dude just blown away honestly and it so many of uh these passages stuck out to me i screenshotted the ones that it really really hit me but i mean this is like everything nolis was talking about in here about like connect connecting to the divine Mm -hmm. through like through imperium art like it dude there's (laughs) there's a lot of connection a lot of it really hit me like right in the heart man Mm -hmm. this is a a brilliant brilliant read Mm -hmm. thank you very much Indeed, indeed. I mean, uh, and it you, means a lot. It means a lot. For sure. We have all of our guests uh, read and respond 
to the essay. If you want to maybe quote a couple of those screenshots and let the audience know which parts you that stood out to you. Yeah, one sec. Let me find this. Uh... And you can also find the, for the, the listeners, you can find the Imperium Art Essay at abnormocracy.com. This is Nullis's website. I, I always include Nullis's website below in all the Imperium Art shows. And of course, you can reach Nullis there as well. And we invite uh, critique. We invite all kinds of discussion on it. Um, we've only, I would say, you know, 95% of the people that we've talked to about it have had positive things to say. Um, granted, a lot of these people are in our sphere, but we depend on our, our, our viewers and our guests to sort of get in there and try to pull it apart and tell us where it could be improved. Absolutely. But yeah, yeah. So that's all good. And I think that's that's a pretty good academic standard in general. But uh, go ahead, Alma. Did you want to read some of those 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 lines? Yeah, I think the only area it could be Im improved is that, Nolis, you need to actually narrate it. I want to hear your... <laughs> Beautiful, <laughs> I want to hear your beautiful Hungarian voice read this thing, dude. <laughs> um, yeah. We'd have to have some visuals too in a nice video, you know. Exactly. I mean, because this it is a work of art itself. Like it's 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 a beautiful. It should be taught thing. in universities. Let's be honest. No, I, I dude, I was blown away. Like I knew this was the big brain show, but like once I started reading this, I realized that this is the big brain show. <laughs> 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 but um. I think the the one paragraph that hit me the hardest was, and I'm going to ask you guys on pronunciation here. Uh, let's see. Nevertheless, I think this is on page four. Nevertheless, it remains important to balance the artistic creation with the reality of nature within the understanding of the transcendental experience of the divine. Okay, here we go. Uh, Thomist philosopher, is that correct? Or Thomas, Tom, Tom, yeah, Thomas. Thomas yeah. philosopher. Okay, Jacques Maritain, is that? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Thomas philosopher Jacques Maritain argued that immoral men can create timeless works of art and artists should not focus on morality in their art. Instead, the only artistic goal should be the pursuit of beauty. Maritain explained that beauty is transcendental and God is subsistent beauty. And I notice you capitalized subsistent beauty there. That's actually really cool. Uh, where the artist consciously or unconsciously pursues a predetermined uh, pursues a predetermined path toward the divine. According to Maritain, this is not based on rational knowledge, rather an innate inclination toward God, regardless of the motivations of the artists. Any great work of aesthetic beauty touches the face of the divine. So like referencing back to that song I've been writing, dude, like why I cry when I am working on it is because is of that, what I just read, touching the face of the divine. Like it's not only getting me in touch with myself, but it's bringing me closer to God or whatever you want to call it, right? The divine. Like it's – that nailed me when, when I read that, dude. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah. I mean that was Maritain's uh, uh, thoughts, but I think it's really, really important to, uh, to focus on this when we're talking about Imperium art and when we're talking about expressing uh, the way we feel emotionally and, and spiritually because I think that there's also – a spiritual battle uh, alongside this uh, culture war and um, an overt racial war, if you will. Um, so so there's there's many fronts that we have to fight on. Mm -hmm. There's something I'm inspired to speak on a little bit from this whole thing is that we often forget that we are in some sense connected to the divine and that you know, it's just, I don't know how to explain this, but we artists, we create something and then everyone around us feels it. They, we we uh, trans, transmit a, a, a profound aesthetic beauty, uh, a meaning it, through our, our art. And everyone around us just feels that and we celebrate it and, and we, we come together with each other. We commune with the divine in our own way. But yet the artist... <laughs> <laughs> has this subjective like I'll never be good enough, you know. We're constantly right. struggling, struggling and striving, and how can I get this, you know, to be this great? But we already are there, you know. We're we're struggling for something that's already found us, as Jim Morrison would say. And uh, it's it's beautiful in in a funny way, I guess, because we we're channeling the divine, but not even aware of it in some sense. Maybe that's true. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, exactly. And that's what it feels like too. Like it, you're getting in touch with, I don't know the one it, it's so hard to describe, dude. It's just, it's something that I, it, I can't really put into words. I just, I just know it's right. Right. I know it's <laughs> what I'm supposed to do. Right. As a right. white man. Yes. And, uh, Oh, God, I, uh, I forgot what I was going to say. Damn. Well, oh, you're wow. on a good track there, though, like knowing <laughs> it's what you're supposed to yeah. do. And earlier I wanted to, I, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I wanted to add to what you were saying about this is the only thing there is to do. Once you wake up to, you know, your your, your Western bio spirit, uh, white genocide, who's behind it all, how it all works, and you see our people in the Western world suffering and struggling and belaboring under all this propaganda and all these anti-white delusions, etc. It, it's, you know, of course, that that's enough to make you, you know, uh, want to quit or go extremist or something or other. But we artists have, have this kind of a purpose we're born to do what we do where we take all that information and we crystallize it in poem song visual art even our philosophers are doing this as well uh video content etc and then we we talk to our people and and the the content we give them is medicine it's some kind of a medicine so you know whether it's divinely inspired or it's some kind of subconscious behavior that we have it, it's kind of hard to say it's very esoteric but it's magical you know i really do believe it's it's magical in this in some sense so i feel like you know it's it's you're you're really on the right path and and there's so much good that's going to come <laughs> out of your future i can you know with your particular voice your particular skill in music and with this intense passion that you have this uh solid mature understanding that this is what i need to do you know it's a gift to our movement it's a gift to our movement and i think it's a great example to other content creators as well please don't make me cry <laughs> All right, uh -oh. uh, now for a commercial break no no <laughs> uh mighty white tissue box it'll get you through the hard times oh <laughs> uh, no anyway well are, is there more in the essay or anything else in the essay that you wanted to respond to yeah like okay so since we're talking about the divine in here uh, let's see i don't know what page this was from um in his book ugly as sin why they changed our churches from sacred places to meeting spaces and how we can change them back again michael s rose laments about the horrific aesthetics of modern church architecture can confirm rose contends that the modern churches aren't just ugly but distort the core tenets of the faith and push catholics away from the religion as a result the deconstruction of theology represented through the lack of aesthetics and architecture take the faithful out of the transcendent experience so one of the cool things about twitter uh, i can't believe i'm saying that is all of the <laughs> the the european art posters right the people who yeah. post the art and the architecture right like Good ones, a lot. and i'm i'm in construction and i see like those cathedrals that were built in like the 1300s dude insane how old they are yeah. and they're so pristine it looks like god made them like it doesn't to me when i look at it it my first reaction or instinct is well that wasn't made by men but it was right so it's and i can't even imagine being in one of those places i've never been to europe i know i'm i, sh I really should go before it completely you know yeah. before it gets worse but i can only imagine being in one of those places and how it would feel you know what i mean when you're surrounded by that that level of beauty and creativity is yeah. is mind-boggling man it gives me the chills truly Truly. And I mean, I always feel that the cathedrals and castles of Europe alone are a testament to our greatness as a people. And I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, you know, forget about science and medicine and astrophysics, you know, and, and uh, symphonies and, and uh, you know, uh, molecular biology or what, you know, or, you know, there's so much that we've done and created without whites, the world would, would be in a, a kind of a perpetual primitive dark age. And I don't mean that in a cocky, arrogant sense. I'm just saying all the people that are abusing us and parasiting off us, hating us, killing us 
you know, they're, they're using the things that we invented and they, they have no sense of gratitude at all. And in, in fact, I would say they're driven by envy, you know, and that's sad. That's a, that's a very low level of, of you know, a non-spirituality or almost an anti-spirituality in a sense. So anyway, I'm, I'm kind of going off topic a bit, but just responding to what you're saying. It's, yeah. It's, you know, I, I wanted to add also, we, we had the episode with, uh, you know, we're, we're on conversations with the one we had the episode with the working man. Um, we also spoke, I think, with uh, uh, Dave Martel. We talked about, um, uh, you know, the working class. Right. And all that, you know, the uh, the tradesmen and and pride in your work, pride in in passing this knowledge on to the next generation, them appreciating the, the knowledge that they're receiving from the masters and and all of these different aspects of of tradesmanship is is of course this is a disease of modernity if you will of technology mm -hmm. because technology is essentially making a lot of these uh traditional modes of uh, construction more more and more obsolete mm -hmm. and and uh, you know obsolete in the sense of efficiency not obsolete in the sense of aesthetics of course and so what we lose, even a shoemaker, a simple shoemaker, a cobbler, you know, the, the beauty that he can make by forming the leather, by, by, by creating something that, that's just aesthetically beautiful, um, you know, it gets lost in this, in this consumerist uh, society where everything is thrown away after two years or a year or, you know, they're waiting for the next big things, um, a suit. Um, even, you know, uh, if you look at these buildings that were built here in the United States, you know, less than a hundred years ago, the construction is, is much different. It, it shows that they took pride in what they did, all the intricate details, the carvings and everything that you have. So you do have that today, but it's only reserved for, uh, an exclusive elite. It's not given to the people anymore. Mm -hmm. It's become more of a kind of a, a show of, of uh, it's become almost gaudy kitsch, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, I'm glad, I'm glad you touched on that, man, because being, being in the trades myself, like the stuff we've built is, um, it ain't like the cathedrals. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's hideous, right? Like, I mean, some of the stuff I've done is actually kind of, is pretty cool. Um, yeah. but compared to what we, what our people used to make, but here's the thing, dude, how long it must have taken to make all that stuff yeah, that's well, not very that's not very profitable is it right so it's right. like how can we do it cheaper faster and to where we make the money and you know that that's that's and it's it's sad it really is because you you drive like in my area where i live there's still a lot of old buildings and old churches right where the architecture yeah. was beautiful at a, at a point and then right across the street is your hideous like sheet metal exterior strip mall just godless looking yeah. thing you know yeah. so it's it's really sad and and it also speaks to a society where a construction project should not last more than 3 years you know and and then of course even the big ones, you know, it shouldn't last more than three years. In the past, you know, it was a generational project. You had uh, one generation build the foundation, the next generation build upon that foundation. And that kind of was representative of the way society thought at the time. You wanted to pass it on. You wanted to build upon it, uh, upon the past. You wanted to build upon the achievements of your ancestors, not demolish the achievements of your ancestors, to build something there that's significantly um, less aesthetically pleasing and also probably, uh, um, I would say, soulless. Well, this is inspiring me. I want to propose something that we make the White Art Collective our cathedral, that we, we, we build the foundations for it through things like Imperium Art and No White Guilt and, and the, the, the shows that we do, um, Conversations with the Wind, etc., our music, it, our art, it, uh, White People's Press, all these things, and that we, we cultivate another generation and help them learn the ropes so that they're more advanced than we are. They don't have to spend half a lifetime to learn and, you know, wake up the way that we have. We can get a, give them a head start and then have them carry that on hopefully and I, I think that that aligns with our spirit certainly the spirit of the imperium art project um so 
as artists, we, in some way, we, how do I say this? We need to mentor other artists. We're not only examples and, and inspiration to people around us, but when we come across other artists, musicians, and et cetera, I'm using art as a blanket term, we should help them. You know, we should kind of take a little extra effort to try to get them, you know, help them <laughs> find the shortcuts around the garbage and, and get into what it is that we do. So that's, that's a, a future concept right there. But uh, Alma, it's, it's been amazing having you on the show. Are there, are there anything more you want to say about the essay or your music? Um, yeah, there's, there's so much to touch on, dude, but I, um, I guess the last one I want to read from the essay is, uh, uh, I don't see what page this was on, but it says, uh, the fundamental elements of Imperium art seek to break the feedback loop imposed by cosmopolitan intellectual movements and globalist socioeconomic elite interests. Through the reappropriation of our heritage, we find unity among our people through our uniquely diverse European experience. Imperium art strives to reignite vitality in our respective Occidental liter literary traditions. Where it said our heritage, right? So I, I, I want to touch on this real quick. Another thing that I've discovered recently that's extremely important my my mother sent me a picture of i think it was my great great aunt right and she looked so so much like my mother who looked so much like my grandmother that just seeing the picture of this woman like touched me you know what i mean like there there was an immediate connection right and uh and that's something that i think this community is also helping it's it's not just helping us discover ourselves. It's it's helping us discover the things that have been and I'm going to use the word raped from us, right? Mm -hmm. So like our connection to our ancestors, our bloodlines. Like the way I see it is, we cannot achieve anything in the future if we cannot harness the present, and we cannot harness the present if we forget the past. And when I say forget the past, I mean our connection to the people who got us here, to who we were born from, mm -hmm. right? The people who did all the great things that made life in Western civilization so awesome that right. unfortunately got ruined by the anti-white bastards. Mm -hmm. But being connected, like that whole ancestral thing, no wonder they want us to hate our past and not like know about our ancestors other than they were quote evil, right? Because we, then we would know what great things they did and then we would realize that, oh, I come from those people so I have, those same, I have that same potential uh oh, that's what they don't want. So it's exactly. like this whole thing about this Imperium art too is like, I got it. everything's so connected, man. But like it, it's also this whole community is helping me get more in touch of where I came from. So my aunt is big into like our, my mother's side of the family and the genealogy. Um, so she sent me a thing, and I've been looking into it, and it's did it's it's just it blows my mind. It's so cool, and I <laughs> saw a picture of my great great grandpa on my mother's side and i kind of look like him right so it's like whoa because I, I really do look like my my grandpa but now i look it's it's just so cool dude it's it's it really awakens more of that spirit of the west when you realize how we got here and and who got us here like it's an amazing it's a big deal <laughs> that's profound <laughs> really oh yeah and yeah. i would encourage everyone to if they can to speak with their parents grandparents great uh, grandparents um, aunts, uncles, whoever they they have, to have them tell stories about the family, whatever they know, record these stories, so that you can pass these stories on to the next generation. Mm -hmm. Recording them is key, actually. That's a yeah. big deal, and archiving them in some sense. Absolutely. Well, uh, so lastly, then, could you tell people where they can find you? I'm on SoundCloud and BitChute because I got banned off of YouTube. I don't know how many times. Um, <laughs> but I'm under uh, – my handle on those channels is MXCISL337. Oh, good that's luck. easy to remember. Yeah, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> the links will be below. Links will be the, yeah, yeah. What? I'm on no. SoundCloud on BitChute. BitChute has horrible sound quality, so I would just go to – or yeah, I would just go to SoundCloud. Any uh, anything to look forward in the future? Any kind of goals that you have? I want to finish the song that I'm writing. I got Sebastian Vilmark to lay down some gnarly cello. I got friend, oh, wow. friend, friendship to do like 
oh dude the piano part he put so there's this bridge uh, you'll hear it you guys will hear it like i want to finish this song and i'm i'm so excited for it and then after that i i don't know i just um, i'll keep writing i guess i mean maybe more collab <laughs> okay. works I, I like doing the collabs with with people in whack it's it's that's really cool too so cool. who who all have you collabed with so far uh, I did that uh, collab with uh, Hyrith and Amalek, and that then I—I uh, I did one with Friendship, but I don't—I don't think it turned out the way he wanted. I played some guitar, and it was actually kind of spooky. It went with his ghost theme, but I—I yes. uh, I haven't heard anything since. But yeah, and then uh, oh god, Amalek's gonna kill me. But I still have—he he, he wants uh, me and Hyrith to do a a cover with him of Rainbow in the Dark by Dio. Oh, but wow. my but my voice, dude, my voice has just been destroyed from this job I've been on because I've been like screaming for sixty hours a week for like four months because you can't hear anything on this job. Right. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, I'll get it done in two weeks, and that was like in February. <laughs> uh, <laughs> if Amalek, if you're listening, I'm sorry, bro. It'll get done. I swear to God. I know. So. Jurius and I were gonna do a, a collab like a year or two ago and i'm like i'm dying i i really need to get back to that but that's beautiful i'm really really happy to hear that you, you you're doing that and i think there's something special about our people coming together and doing these cool mashups with our, our yeah. different styles that we need a lot more of that you know i should be doing that so this is another inspiration that you've left us with so thank you once again alma lahar the links are below people get connected um please take away the wonderful examples of, of his life his struggles his music please share subscribe comment below and have a wonderful evening well, take care everybody